NASA and SpaceX signed an unfunded Space Act agreement on Thursday, September 22nd to investigate the feasibility of a SpaceX and Polaris program plan to use the Dragon spacecraft to lift the agency's Hubble Space Telescope into a higher orbit at no expense to the government. NASA has no intention to compete for this chance, so what's the deal, and if so, what is known about the research? Well, let's check. To begin with, let's look at NASA and SpaceX's possibility to reboost the Hubble Telescope. SpaceX proposed this study in cooperation with the Polaris program to better understand the technical restrictions involved with servicing missions other businesses may propose comparative investigations using different rockets or spacecrafts as models the study team estimates that obtaining technical data from Hubble in the SpaceX Dragon mission will take up to six months this data will determine if there is safe to rendezvous dock and move the telescope to a more stable orbit quote this study is an intriguing illustration of the innovative way NASA's researching through private public partnerships said Thomas Zerbichin associate administrator for NASA headquarters in Washington. As our fleet grows, we want to look into various options for enabling the most robust, excellent science missions imaginable. While Hubble and the Dragon will be utilized as test models for this inquiry, elements of the mission concept may apply to other spacecraft, particularly those in near-Earth orbits such as Hubble. Hubble has been in service since 1990, hovering 335 miles above Earth in a slowly descending orbit. Repositioning Hubble is a higher, more stable orbit could add many years to its working life. When Hubble's operational life is up, NASA NASA plans to securely deorbit or dispose of it. SpaceX and the Polaris program want to push the boundaries of current technology and study how commercial collaborations may address difficult, complex challenges in creative ways, said Jessica Jensen, SpaceX's vice president of customer operations and integrations. Quote, missions like Hubble servicing would help us improve our space capabilities, supporting all of us in realizing our ambitions of becoming a space-fearing, multi-planetary civilization. Moving on, in Japan, Starlink is now available. SpaceX announced Monday that that Starlink is now available in Japan, making it the first Asian country to do so. KDDI Corporation announced in September 2021 that it had selected Starlink to supply high-speed, low-latency broadband internet to its 1,200 remote mobile towers. Quote, as early as 2022, KDDI will be able to provide its rural mobile clients an urban mobile connectivity experience, the business said in a statement. The MIC, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, has granted the experimental license to KDDI's Yamaguchi Satellite Communication Center to operate the ground link for Starlink service. Both companies have been doing a series of technological demos to assess the quality and performance of their product, it added, according to Nakai Aisha. KDDI is Japan's second largest mobile operator, reaching more than 90% of the population with 4G service. It also had a platinum frequency brand that covers more than 60% of the land surface. Elon Musk announced, quote, two fairly big agreements with major country telecoms during the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, but did not divulge the identities. Although KDDI KDDI is one of them, according to the outlet, according to a recent Financial Times interview with Elon Musk, China's one Asian country that does not want Starlink. Musk claims that Beijing has expressed displeasure with his recent deployment of Starlink, SpaceX's satellite communication system in Ukraine to assist the military in circumnavigating Russia's internet shutdown. He claims Beijing demanded assurances that he would not sell Starlink in China, according to the publication. Following that, Ariana 6 upper stage testing underway. Ariana Group has begun static fire testing of the upper stage of the Ariane 6 rocket, a critical milestone in the construction of the vehicle, the first launch of which is still unknown. Ariana Group and the European Space Agency announced on October 6th that they had begun a series of hot fire testing of the Ariane 6 upper stage and its Vinci engine at the German Aerospace Center's test facility in Lampoldshausen, Germany, DLR. The October 5th test firing was the first of four scheduled to qualify for the stage for flight. Quote, the compilation of hot fire Firing test is a key step towards Ariane 6 qualification and a successful first flight. Ariana Group CEO Andre Hubert Rossell said in a statement, the Vinci engines run on liquid hydrogen and oxygen propellants and may be reignited up to four times, allowing for intricate payload developments. In place of helium, an auxiliary power unit pressurizes the propellant tanks. Besides microgravity and vacuum, the Lampold Shawson test site is intended to recreate the conditions that the upper stage may encounter during a launch after completing the hot fire test, the stage will be sent to an ESA laboratory in the Netherlands for acoustic and stage separation testing. Simultaneously, other Ariana 6 gear is being tested at the launch site in French Guania in what is known as combined tests to investigate interfaces between the launch vehicle and ground infrastructure. Ariana Group factories in Bremen, Germany, and Le Marou, France, assembling the stages for the Ariane 6 first flying model. Next up, Virgin Orbit awaiting license for first UK launch. The British government has 
has yet to grant Virgin Orbit a launch license. For its upcoming Launcher 1 mission, the country's maiden orbital launch on October 5th, Virgin Orbit reported that it had completed a mission launch rehearsal, including rocket fueling at California's Mojave Air and Spaceport three days earlier. The vehicle is now ready for flight, according to the corporation. Unlike previous Launcher 1 operations, this mission will take place on Cornwall, England, rather than Mojave, California. This includes getting a launch permit from the United Kingdom Civil Aviation Authority, CAA. The launch license has yet to be issued and the business announced on October 5th that a launch date must be established through the launch permitting regulatory processes. During an IPO Edge webinar on October 6th, Dan Hart, CEO of Virgin Orbit, stated that the company is working closely with the CAA on licensing application citing meetings he had quite recently with the UK government authorities. Quote, there is a strong determination to continue forward, he added, of the planned launch. However, there are certain worries and it's vital to our company to guarantee that roles are clearly defined and that safety comes first. Hart indicates that whether the company has an internal launch date but would not disclose it, it'll be out in three days, he promised. Right now, we're working on rocket and equipment delivery logistics. According to industry sources, the business planned to launch by October 29th, but that date appears to be in peril because of the time required to prepare for the launch in Cornwall and obtain the launch license. Moving on, India's on schedule to launch OneWeb in the second half of October. India aims to launch the first OneWeb satellites in eight months in the second part of October. According to the Indian Space Agency, ISRO, on October 5th, ISRO announced that 36 satellites for the British broadband company will be fitted onto the upper stage of India's GSLV Mark III medium lift rocket in the coming days. After passing health inspections, the satellites were combined into a dispenser unit and transported to India's Satish Dhawan Space Center last month from a manufacturer in Florida. Beyond Gravity, based in Switzerland, created the dispenser, which links the satellites and the rockets formerly Ruag Space. Beyond Gravity also supplied dispensers that Air in Space utilized to launch 428 of OneWeb's planned 648 satellites using Soyuz launch vehicles. After sanctions imposed in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine effectively prohibited Western corporations from utilizing Russian rockets, Ariana Space was compelled to halt the deployment of OneWeb's constellation. The last batch of 36 satellites was scheduled to launch from Russia's Balkanor Cosmodrome on March 4th, but Russia enforced poison pill conditions as international tensions deteriorated. The British operator suspended any further Soyuz missions. Beyond Gravity's launcher division executive, Vice President Paul Horstink, said, quote, just a little change was required to make the dispenser used for OneWeb Soyuz launches compatible with GSLV Mark III. Quote, this will be the first flight of a dispenser, he added atop an Indian rocket. ISRO's commercial arm, New Space India Limited NSIL, will undertake the launch from one of the two launch pads at Satish Dewan Space Center, capable of orbital missions. Finally, Sierra Space recruits a former SpaceX official as CIO. Sierra Space has hired a former SpaceX executive as its chief information officer as the business prepares to work on commercial spaceships and a space station. On October 6th, the corporate announced the appointment of Ken Venner, a senior vice president and chief information officer. Venner was the CIO of SpaceX from 2012 to 18, and he was most recently the president and chief product officer of eShare, a firm that develops collaboration software. Sierra Space's chief operating officer, Jeff Babione, described Venner's hire as part of the company's growing efforts since it was spun off from the Sierra Nevada Corporation last year. Quote, we're certain that he will play a vital role in assisting the company's further expansion and development of platforms in space to enhance life on Earth. He said in a statement through Dream Chaser, Orbital Reef, and the other initiative, Sierra Space is at the forefront of the emerging space economy and it's uniquely positioned to build a vibrant, growing, and accessible commercial space economy. Benner said in a statement, quote, I'm excited to help Sierra Space grow and solidify its position in an industry leader in the commercial space economy. Benner had been at Sierra Space for three months before the company announced his hiring as CIO, quote, excited to be part of the team that will make space affordable and accessible to all. He wrote on LinkedIn last week, I've been here since 7522, just had the time to update my LinkedIn status. Well, that marks the end of today's video, my friends. We hope you enjoyed it. On your way out, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.